Latin American liberation theologian John Sabrino, over the course of his long career in El Salvador, has reminded the world over and over that the first task of Christian theology is to try to attempt what he calls honesty toward reality. But he says that this is a very difficult task. Why? Because, he says, our world is characterized by institutions and systems of injustice and violence. But even more, he goes further to say that our world also is characterized by systems of concealment of injustice and violence. This makes it excruciatingly diff difficult for us to be honest toward reality. Chris Hedge's work as a thinker, as a writer, and as an activist brings to mind for me what Sabrino says, especially with respect to this dynamic of concealment. In his 2003 book, What Every Person Should Know About War, he faced readers with questions that they should know the answers to before joining the military or supporting any war. Questions like this, what will a bullet do to my body? Will I feel guilty in combat? How does the military condition me to fight and kill? In another book, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, he helped us to see more deeply why war is at once so deeply attractive and compelling for human beings, and why we tend to remember war often so poorly and superficially. In the last year, he worked with other plaintiffs to bring a lawsuit against President Obama with respect to the National Defense Authorization Act. This legislation would permit the military to seize U.S. citizens, disallow them due process, and hold them in military facilities if they're suspected to support certain terrorist organizations. Hedges wrote, there were times in my 20-year career as a foreign correspondent, especially when I reported events or opinions that challenged the official narrative, that the US government made little distinction between me and groups that were antagonistic to the United States. In those days, there was no law that could be used to seize and detain me. Now there is. Tonight, Mr. Hedges helps us to attempt, once again, honesty toward reality with respect to themes from his most recent work. And it's with uh, award-winning cartoonist, Joe Sacco. Days of destruction, days of revolt. Please help me to welcome him. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for not reading my Wikipedia bio as an intro. I don't write it, so it's like I'm sort of hostage to somebody I don't know who does write it. Perhaps the most prescient portrait of the American character and our ultimate fate as a species is found in Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Melville, in his novel, makes our murderous obsessions, blinding hubris, violent impulses, moral cowardice, and lust for self-destruction visible in his chronicle of a doomed whaling voyage. He is our foremost oracle, what William Shakespeare was to Elizabethan England, or Fyodor Dostoevsky was to Tsarist Russia. In Moby Dick, our country is given shape in the form of the ship, the Pequod, named after the Pequot Indian tribe exterminated in 1638 by the Puritans and their Native American allies. The ship's 30-man crew, there were 30 states in the Union when Melville wrote the novel, is a mixture of races and creeds. The object of the hunt is a massive white whale, Moby Dick which in a previous encounter maimed the ship's captain, Ahab, by dismembering one of his legs. 
the maniacal quest, much like that of a civilization, dependent on fossil fuel and the profits of global speculators, assures the Pequod's destruction. And those on the ship, on some level, know they are doomed, just as many of us know that our civilization and our ecosystem cannot stand the continued assault by corporate capitalism. But when a man suspects any wrong, it sometimes happens that if he be already involved in the matter, he insensibly strives to cover up his suspicions from himself, Ishmael says in Moby Dick. And much this way it was with me. I said nothing and tried to think nothing. How much longer can a financial system that depends on the Federal Reserve to purchase $85 billion in U.S. Treasury bonds, much of it worthless subprime mortgages, each month survive. How much more money, we are now at 15 to $20 trillion, can be looted from the U.S. Treasury by big banks and Wall Street firms before the financial system again implodes? How much longer can wages be driven down and suppressed while interest rates, which can soar to 30%, cripple us with debt peonage. The ecosystem is at the same time swiftly disintegrating. Scientists from the International Program on the State of the Ocean a few days ago issued a new report that warned that the oceans are changing faster than anticipated and increasingly becoming inhospitable to life. The excess CO2 and heat from the atmosphere is rapidly warming and acidifying ocean seas. This is compounded, the report noted, by increased levels of deoxygenation from nutrient runoffs from farming and climate change. The scientists call these effects a deadly trio that when combined are creating changes in the seas that, in their words, are unprecedented in the planet's history. The scientists wrote that each of the Earth's five known mass extinctions was preceded by at least one of these deadly trios, acidification, warming, and deoxygenation. They warned that, quote, the next mass extinction of sea life is already underway, the first such mass extinction in 55 million years. The University of Hawaii also released a new report saying that the effects of climate change are now inevitable. They cannot be stopped. At best, the rate of devastation can be slowed. The report predicted that over the next 50 years, temperature levels will rise to such a degree that human life in many parts of the planet will become unsustainable. Millions upon millions of people will flee as refugees. Millions of species will face extinction. Coastal cities such as New York and even inland cities such as London will become unlivable. Microbes seem set to inherit the earth. Yet we, like Ahab and his crew, do not change course. We do not trust our eyes or our brains. We trust in the myth of human progress, the absurd belief that human technology and ingenuity will save us, that somehow, although no one spells out how, we will all be able to adapt. This myth is abetted by the corporate assault on culture, journalism, education, the arts, and critical thinking. Those who speak the truth are marginalized and ignored, dismissed as pessimists in a culture that prides itself on a childlike optimism at the expense of reality. We have a mania for hope, which our corporate masters lavishly provide across the political and cultural spectrum to keep us passive. Frederick Nietzsche in Beyond Good and Evil wrote that only a few people have the fortitude to look into what he calls the molten pit of human reality. A handful of artists and philosophers for Nietzsche are consumed by an insatiable curiosity, a quest for truth, a desire for meaning, and this sends them down into the bowels of the pit. They get as close as they can before the flames and heat drive them back. This understanding, Nietzsche wrote, comes at a high cost. 
Those singed by the fire become burnt children, eternal orphans in empires of illusion. Dying civilizations make war on independent intellectual inquiry, art and culture on the burnt children. The masters of the corporate state do not want us to peer into the pit or heed the cries of those who have seen what awaits us. The corporate state rather feeds the thirst for illusion, happiness, and hope. It peddles the fantasy of endless material progress. It insists, and this is the argument of globalization, that our voyage is unalterable, decreed by natural law. It is part of the march of human progress, and those who challenge this myth are heretics. Clive Hamilton, in his book, Requiem for a Species, Why We Resist the Truth About Climate Change, describes a kind of dark relief that comes from accepting that catastrophic climate change is virtually certain. This obliteration of false hopes, he says, requires an intellectual knowledge and an emotional knowledge. The first is attainable, the second because it means those we love, including our children, will face insecurity, misery, and suffering within a few decades, if not a few years, is much harder to acquire. To emotionally accept impending disaster, to attain the gut-level understanding that the power elite will not respond rationally to collapse, is as difficult to accept as our own mortality. The most daunting existential struggle of our time is to ingest this awful truth intellectually and emotionally, and yet rise up to resist the corporate forces that are destroying us. The human species, led by white Europeans and Euro-Americans, has been on a 500-year-long planet-wide rampage of conquering, plundering, looting, exploiting, and polluting the earth, as well as killing the indigenous communities that stood in the way. But the game is up. The technological and scientific forces that created a life of unparalleled luxury as well as unrivaled military and economic power for a small global elite are the forces that now doom us. The capitalist quest for ceaseless economic expansion has become a curse, a death sentence. But even as our economic and environmental systems unravel, after the hottest year in the contiguous 48 states since record keeping began 107 years ago. We lack the vision and the courage to shut down the engines of global capitalism. Complex civilizations, as many anthropologists have observed, have a habit of ultimately destroying themselves. Joseph Tainter in The Collapse of Complex Societies, Charles Redman in Human Impact on Ancient Environments, and Ronald Wright in a short history of progress, have laid out the familiar patterns that lead to systems breakdown. The difference is that when we go down this time, the whole planet will go with us. There will, with this final collapse, be no new lands to exploit, no new civilizations to conquer, no new peoples to subjugate, no new resources to plunder. Collapse occurs in complex societies, not long, after they reach their period of greatest power and prosperity. One of the most pathetic aspects of human history is that every civilization expresses itself most pretentiously, compounds its partial and universal values most convincingly, and claims immortality for its finite existence at the very moment when the decay which leads to death has already begun, Reinhold Niebuhr wrote. The ancient Mayan, the Sumerians of what is now southern Iraq, ancient Egypt, Greece, Rome, even Easter Island, were destroyed by the mechanisms that once made them prosper. The novel ways these civilizations found to exploit the environment, such as the invention of irrigation systems, eventually created disastrous, unforeseen complications. Ronald Wright, in A Short History of Progress, calls this the progress trap. The Industrial Revolution created technological civilizations of such complexity and such dependence 
on ceaseless exploitation, write notes, that we do not know how to make do with less or reduce our demands on nature. We know only how to service and maintain a system that is now killing us. This is the evolutionary history of the human race. As the collapse becomes increasingly palpable, if human history is any guide, we, like past societies in distress, will see many retreat into what anthropologists call crisis cults. The powerlessness felt in the face of ecological and economic chaos will unleash further collective delusions, a belief, for example, that God or gods will come back to earth and save us. The Christian right embodies the escapism of crisis cults. These cults will perform, perform absurd rituals, in our case probably Christian, to make it all go away. Believers will be entranced by magical thinking. Our bankers, corporate boards, politicians, television personalities, and generals hold up seductive images of unrivaled wealth and power. Like Ahab and his crew, these images spur us towards self-annihilation. All my means are sane, Ahab says, my motive and my object mad. Melville, who had been a sailor on clipper ships and whalers, was aware that the wealth of industrialized societies was violently seized from the wretched of the earth. All the authority figures on the ship are white men, Ahab, Starbuck, Flask, and Stubb. The hard, dirty work, from harpooning to gutting the carcasses of whales, is the task of the poor, mostly men of color. Melville saw how European plundering of indigenous cultures from the 16th to the 19th century, coupled with the use of African slaves as a workforce to replace the natives enriched Europe, and the United States. The Spanish conquest of the Americas set in motion five centuries of reckless economic and environmental plunder. Karl Marx and Adam Smith each attributed the huge influx of wealth from the Americas as having been made possible by the Industrial Revolution and modern capitalism. The Industrial Revolution equipped technologically advanced states with refined weapon systems turning us into the most efficient killers on the planet. Ahab, when he first appears on the quarterdeck, after being in his captain for the first few days of the voyage, holds up a doubloon, an extravagant gold coin, and promises it to the crew member who first spots the white whale. He knows that the permanent constitutional condition of the manufactured man is sordidness, and he plays to this sordidness. <clears throat> the whale becomes, like everything in the capitalist world, a commodity, a source of personal profit, a murderous greed, one that Starbuck denounces as blasphemous, immediately grips the crew. Ahab's obsession infects the ship. Ahab conducts a dark mass, a Eucharist of violence and blood on the deck. He orders the crew to circle around him. He makes them drink drink from a flagon that is passed from man to man, filled with droughts hot as Satan's hoof. Ahab tells the harpooners to cross their lances before him. The captain grasps the harpoons and anoints the ship's harpooners, Queequeg, Tashtego, and Dagu, his three pagan kinsmen. He orders them to detach the iron sections of their harpoons and fill the sockets with the fiery waters from the pewter. Drink, ye harpooners, drink and swear, ye men, that man the deathful whaleboat's crew. Death to Moby Dick. God hunt us all if we do not hunt Moby Dick to his death. And with the crew bonded to him in his infernal quest, he knows that Starbuck is helpless amid the general hurricane. Starbuck now is mine, Ahab says. Cannot oppose me now. Without rebellion, the honest eye of Starbuck, Melville writes, fell downward. The ship, described by Melville as a hearse, was painted black. It was adorned with gruesome trophies of the hunt, festooned with the huge teeth and bones of sperm whales. 
It was, Melville writes, a cannibal of a craft, tricking herself forth in the chaste bones of her enemies. The fires used to melt the whale blubber at night turned the Pequod into a red hell. And we live now on our own hearse, our own raging fires, leaping up from our oil refineries and the explosions of our ordnance across the Middle East, bespeak our lust for blood and profit. And in our mad pursuit, we ignore the suffering of those who impede our hunt, just as Ahab does when he refuses to help the captain of a passing ship who is frantically searching for his son who has fallen overboard. Ahab is not solely reliant on the heated rhetoric of persuasion. He oversees a terrifying internal security force on the ship, the five dusky phantoms that seem fresh formed out of air. Ahab's secret, private, whaleboat crew, his private mercenaries, keeps the rest of the ship in abject submission. The art of propaganda and the use of brutal coercion and fear are the familiar tools of tyranny. And our lives are as circumscribed as the lives of the crew on Melville's ship. The novel, in essence, is the chronicle of the last days of a civilization. And yet Ahab is no simple tyrant. Melville, at the end of the novel, gives us two glimpses into the internal battle between Ahab's maniacal hubris and his humanity. Ahab, too, has a yearning for love. He harbors regrets over his deformed life. The black cabin boy, Pip, is the only crew member who evokes any tenderness in the captain. Ahab is aware of this tenderness. He fears its power. Pip functions as the fool did in Shakespeare's King Lear. Ahab warns Pip of Ahab. Lad, lad, says Ahab, I tell thee, thou must not follow Ahab now. The hour is coming when Ahab would not scare thee from him, yet would not have thee by him. A few pages later, untottering Ahab stood forth in the clearness of the morn, lifting his splintered helmet of a brow to the fair girl's forehead of heaven. From beneath his slouched hat, Ahab dropped a tear into the sea, nor did all the Pacific contain such wealth as that one wee drop. Starbuck approaches him. Ahab, for the only time in the book, is vulnerable. He speaks to Starbuck of his 40 years on the pitiless sea, the desolation of solitude it has been, why this strife of the chase, why weary and palsy the arm at the oar, and the iron, and the lance. How the richer or better is Ahab now? He thinks of his young wife. I widowed that poor girl when I married her, Starbuck, and of his little boy. About this time, yes, it is his noon nap now. The boy vivaciously wakes, sits up in bed, and his mother tells him of me, of cannibal old me, how I am abroad upon the deep, but will yet come back to dance with him again. Ahab's thirst for dominance, vengeance, and destruction, however, overpowers these faint regrets of lost love and thwarted compassion. Hatred wins. What is it, Ahab finally asks? What nameless, inscrutable, unearthly thing is it? What cozening hidden lord and master and cruel, remorseless emperor commands me? that against all natural lovings and longings, I so keep pushing and crowding and jamming myself on all the time. Melville knew that physical courage and moral courage are distinct. One can be brave on a whaling ship or a battlefield, yet a coward before human evil. Starbuck elucidates this division the first mate is tormented by his complicity in what he foresees as Ahab's impious end. Starbuck, while generally abiding firm in the conflict with seas or winds or whales or any of the ordinary irrational horrors of the world, 
it cannot withstand those more terrific because spiritual terrors which sometimes menace you from the concentrating brow of an enraged and mighty man. Mutiny was the only salvation for the Pequod's crew. It is our only salvation, but moral cowardice turns us into hostages. I am reading and rereading the debates among some of the great radical thinkers of the 19th and 20th centuries about the mechanisms of social change. These debates were not academic. They were frantic searches for the triggers of revolt. Lenin placed his faith in a violent uprising, a professional, disciplined, revolutionary vanguard freed from moral constraints, and like Marx, in the inevitable emergence of the worker's state. Proudhon insisted that gradual change would be accomplished as enlightened workers took over production and educated and converted the rest of the proletariat. Bakunin predicted the catastrophic breakdown of the capitalist order, something we are likely to witness in our lifetime, and new autonomous worker federations rising up out of the chaos. Kropotkin, like Proudhon, believed in an evolutionary process that would hammer out a new society. Emma Goldman, along with Kropotkin, came to be very wary both of the efficacy of violence and the revolutionary potential of the masses. The mass, Goldman wrote bitterly toward the end of her life, echoing Marx, clings to its masters, loves the whip, and is the first to cry crucify. The revolutionists of history counted on a mobilized base of enlightened industrial workers. The building blocks of revolt, they believed, relied on the tool of the general strike, the ability of workers to cripple the mechanisms of production. Strikes could be sustained with the support of political parties, strike funds, and union halls. Workers without these support mechanisms had to replicate the infrastructure of parties and unions if they wanted to put prolonged pressure on the bosses and the state. But now, with the decimation of the U.S. manufacturing base, along with the dismantling of our unions and opposition parties, we will have to search for different instruments of rebellion. We will have to develop a revolutionary theory that is not reliant on the industrial or agrarian muscle of workers. Most manufacturing jobs have disappeared, and of those that remain, few are unionized. Our family farms have been destroyed by agribusinesses. Monsanto and its Faustian counterparts on Wall Street rule. They are steadily poisoning our lives and rendering us powerless. The corporate leviathan, which is global, is freed from the constraints of a single nation state or government. Corporations are beyond regulation or control. Politicians are too anemic or more often too corrupt to stand in the way of the accelerating corporate destruction. This makes our struggle different from the revolutionary struggles in industrial societies in the past. Our revolt will look more like what erupted in less industrialized Slavic republics, Russia, Spain, and China, and uprisings led by disenfranchised rural and urban working class and peasantry in the liberation movements that swept through Africa and Latin America. The dispossessed working poor, along with unemployed college students and graduates, Unemployed journalists, lawyers, and teachers, along with impoverished artists, will form our movement. And this is why the fight for a higher minimum wage is crucial to uniting service workers with, alienated, with the alienated college-educated sons and daughters of the declining middle class. Bakunin, unlike Marx, considered these déclassé intellectuals essential for successful revolt. It is not the poor who make revolutions. It is those who conclude that they will not be able, as they once expected, to rise economically and socially. Service workers and fast food workers know they are trapped, as does the swelling population of college graduates caught in a vice of low-paying jobs and obscene amounts of debt. These two groups, once united, 
will be our primary engines of revolt. Much of the urban poor has been crippled and in many cases broken by a rewriting of laws, especially drug laws, that has permitted courts, probation officers, parole boards, and police to randomly seize poor people of color, especially African American men, without just cause and lock them in cages for years. In many of our most impoverished urban centers, our internal colonies as Malcolm X called them, mobilization will be difficult. The urban poor are in chains and those chains are being readied for the rest of us. Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stephan examined 100 years of violent and nonviolent resistant movements in their book, Why Civil Resistance Works. <coughs> they concluded that nonviolent movements succeed twice as often as violent uprisings. Violent movements work primarily in civil wars or in ending foreign occupations, they found. Nonviolent movements appeal to those within the power structure, especially the police and civil servants, who are cognizant of the corruption and decadence of the power elite and are willing, in the end, to abandon them. And we need only 1 to 5 percent of the population actively working for the overthrow of a system, history has shown, to bring down even the most ruthless totalitarian structures. Rebellion works on two tracks, building alternative structures, such as public banks, to free ourselves from the control and finding mechanisms to halt the machine. The most important impediment facing us now is not ideological, it is logistical. The security and surveillance state has made its highest priority the breaking of any infrastructure that mark, might spark widespread unrest or revolt. The state knows the tinder is there. It knows that the continued unraveling of the economy and the effects of climate change make popular unrest inevitable. It knows that as underemployment and unemployment doom at least a quarter of the U.S. population, perhaps more to perpetual poverty, and as unemployment benefits are scaled back, as schools close, as the middle class withers away, as pension funds are looted by hedge fund thieves, and as the government continues to let the fossil fuel industry ravage the planet, the future will increasingly be one of open conflict. The battle against the corporate state right now is primarily about building an infrastructure to sustain resistance. The state, in its internal projections, has a vision of the future that is as dystopian as mine. But the state, to protect itself, uses its mechanisms of propaganda to assure us that we can continue to build a society based on limitless growth, profligate consumption, and a dependence on fossil fuel. The mania for hope is fed at the expense of truth. The corporate state, meanwhile, is preparing secretly for the world it knows is actually coming. It is cementing into place a pervasive police state, one that includes the complete evisceration of our most basic civil liberties and the militarization of the internal security apparatus, as well as the wholesale surveillance of the citizenry. Those with the moral courage to expose this security and surveillance apparatus, Chelsea Manning, Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, Jeremy Hammond, are criminalized and persecuted. We will be sustained in our revolt, which will require us to confront all systems of power by the transcendental. Chants, work songs, spirituals, the blues, poetry, dance, and art converged under slavery to nourish and sustain the imagination of African Americans. These were the forces that, as Ralph Ellison wrote, we had in place of freedom. The oppressed would be the first, for they often know their fate, to admit that on a rational level, such a notion is absurd. But they also know that it is only through the imagination that they survive. Jewish inmates in Auschwitz reportedly put God on trial for the Holocaust and then condemned God to death. This is a rational response to the horror of the Holocaust. A rabbi stood after the verdict 
to lead the evening prayers. This is the absurdity we must capture. African Americans and Native Americans for centuries had little control over their destinies. Forces of bigotry and violence kept them subjugated by whites. Suffering for the oppressed was tangible. Death was a constant companion. And it was only their imagination, as William Faulkner noted at the end of The Sound and the Fury, that permitted them, unlike the novel's white Compson family, to endure. The theologian James Cohn captures this in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Cohn says that for oppressed blacks, the cross on which Jesus was crucified was a paradoxical religious symbol because it inverts the world's value system with the news that hope comes by way of defeat, that suffering and death do not have the last word, that the last shall be first and the first last. Cohn continues, that God could make a way out of no way in Jesus' cross was truly absurd to the intellect, yet profoundly real in the souls of black folk, enslaved blacks who first heard the gospel, message seized on the power of the cross. Christ crucified manifest God's loving and liberating presence in the contradictions of black life, the transcendent presence in the lives of black Christians that empowered them to believe that ultimately, in God's eschatological future, they would not be defeated by the troubles of this world, no matter how great and painful their suffering. Believing this paradox, this absurd claim of faith, was only possible in humility and repentance. There was no place for the proud and the mighty, for people who think that God called them to rule over others. The cross was God's critique of power, white power, with powerless love, snatching victory out of defeat. Reinhold Niebuhr labeled this capacity to defy forces of repression, even in the face of near certain defeat, a sublime madness in the soul. Niebuhr wrote that nothing but madness will do battle with malignant power and spiritual wickedness in high places. This sublime madness, as Niebuhr understood, is vital. Without it, truth is obscured. And Niebuhr also knew that traditional liberalism was a useless force in moments of extremity. Liberalism, Niebuhr said, lacks the spirit of enthusiasm, not to say fanaticism, which is so necessary to move the world out of its beaten tracks. It is too intellectual and too little emotional to be an effective force in history. The prophets in the Hebrew Bible spoke out of this sublime madness. The words of the Hebrew prophets, as Abraham Heschel wrote, were a scream in the night. While the world is at ease and asleep, the prophet feels the blast from heaven. The prophet, because he or she saw and faced an unpleasant reality, was, Heschel said, compelled to proclaim the very opposite of what his or her heart expected. Rebellion is a moral imperative. It is to be carried out regardless of the possibilities of success. It is not for the practical or the timid. It is an act that is performed in the end because of, in times of despair and suffering, it affirms life. Primo Levi, in his memoir, Survival in Auschwitz, tells of teaching Italian to another inmate, Jean Samuel, in exchange for lessons in French. Levy recites to Samuel from memory, Canto 26 of Dante's The Inferno. It is the story of Ulysses' final voyage. We cheered, but soon that cheering turned to woe, for then a whirlwind, born from the strange land, battered our little vessel on the prow. Three times the boat and all the sea were whirled, and at the fourth, to please another's will, the aft tipped in the air, the prow went down until the ocean closed above our bones. He has received the message, Levy writes of his friend and what they shared in Dante. He has felt 
that it has to do with him, that it has to do with all men who toil, and with us in particular. Levy goes on, it is vitally necessary and urgent that he listen, that he understand, before it is too late. Tomorrow he or I might be dead, or we might never see each other again. It is only those who find the courage to peer into the molten pit who can minister to the suffering of those around them. They will be infected with this sublime madness. As Hannah Arendt wrote in The Origins of Totalitarianism, the only morally reliable people are not those who say, this is wrong, or this should not be done, but those who say, I can't. They know that, as Immanuel Kant wrote, if justice perishes, human life on earth has lost its meaning. And this means that, like Socrates, we must come to a place where it is better to suffer wrong than to do wrong, no matter what happens around us. We can surmount despair, not by ignoring reality, but by responding radically to it. And this includes acts of civil disobedience, including jail time. In these acts, we become fully human. One of the only coherent philosophical positions is revolt, Camus wrote. It is a constant confrontation between man and his obscurity. It is not aspiration, for it is devoid of hope. That revolt is the certainty of a crushing fate without the resignation that ought to accompany it. Those we must follow now will be as ornery and mad as all prophets. They will call us to lives of steadfast defiance. They will be burnt children. The people noticed that Crazy Horse was queerer than ever, Black Elk said, in remembering the final days of the wars of Western expansion. He went on to say of the great Sioux warrior, he hardly ever stayed in the camp. People would find him out alone in the cold, and they would ask him to come home with them. He would not come, but sometimes he would tell the people what to do. People wondered if he ate anything at all. Once my father found him out alone like that, and he said to my father, Uncle, you have noticed me the way I act, but do not worry. There are caves and holes for me to live in, and out here the spirits may help me. I am making plans for the good of my people. Homer, Dante, Beethoven, Melville, Dostoevsky, Proust, Joyce, W.H. Auden, Emily Dickinson, and James Baldwin, along with artists such as the sculptor David Smith, the photographer Diane Arbus, and the blues musician Charlie Patton, all had this sublime madness. It is the sublime madness that lets one sing, as bluesman Ishman Bracey did in Hines County, Mississippi, I've been down so long, Lord, down don't worry me. And yet, in the midst of imagination also lies the absurdity and certainty of divine justice. I feel my hell horizon arise in every day. I feel my hell horizon arise in every day. Someday it'll burst this levee and wash the whole world away. Shakespeare's greatest heroes and heroines, Prospero, Anthony, Juliet, Rosalind, Hamlet, Cordelia have this sublime madness. King Lear, once he was stripped of power and forced to live with the persecuted and poor, had it. It was only then that he could see. It was only then that he understood that unbridled human lust and hubris led to the suicide of the species. It will come, Albany says in the play. Humanity must perforce prey on itself like monsters of the deep. The poems of Frederico Garcia Lorca, Lorca sustain the Republicans fighting the fascists in Spain. Music, dance, drama, art, song, painting were the fire and drive 
of all of history's resistance movements. The rebel units in El Salvador, when I covered the war, always traveled with musicians and theater groups. Art, as Emma Goldman pointed out, has the power to make ideas felt. Goldman noted that when Andrew Undershaft, a character in George Bernard Shaw's play, Major Barbara, said poverty is the worst of crimes and all other crimes are virtues beside it, his impassioned declaration elucidated the cruelty of class warfare more effectively than Shaw's socialist tracts. The degradation of education into vocational training for the corporate state, the destructions of the humanities, arts, and journalism, the hijacking of these disciplines by corporate sponsors, severs the population from understanding, self-actualization, and transcendence. In aesthetic terms, the corporate state seeks to crush beauty, truth, and imagination, and this is the war waged by all totalitarian systems. The role of the artist, then, precisely, is to illuminate that darkness, blaze roads through the vast forest, James Baldwin wrote, so that we will not, in all our doing, lose sight of its purpose, which is, after all, to make the world a more humane dwelling place. Ultimately, the artist and the revolutionary function as they function and pay whatever dues they must pay behind it because they are both possessed by a vision that they do not so much follow this vision as find themselves driven by it, Baldwin wrote. Otherwise, they could never endure, much less embrace the lives they are compelled to lead. I do not know if we can build a better society. I do not even know if we will survive as a species. But I know these corporate forces have us by the throat and they have my children by the throat. I do not fight fascists because I will win. I fight fascists because they are fascists. And this is a fight which in the face of the overwhelming forces arrayed against us requires us to embrace sublime madness, to find in acts of rebellion the embers of life, an intrinsic meaning that lies outside the certainty of success. We must at once grasp our reality and then refuse to allow reality to paralyze us. We must make an absurd leap of faith. We must believe, despite the empirical evidence around us, that the good always draws to it the good. We do not know where acts of goodness go, the Buddhists call it karma, but in these acts we make visible a better world. It is time for our own mutiny, for the overthrow of our own Ahabs, for the redirecting of our ship away from certain death back towards life. No matter how bleak things get, we always have a choice in life. We can choose to be rebels or slaves, and that choice is one the corporate state is powerless to take from us. And to rebel, even if we fail, is to succeed. We must become a threat to the security and surveillance state and its corporate overlords. And we cannot become a threat if we do not engage in actions that actively obstruct power. The Turkish poet, Nazim Hikmet, who spent most of his adult life in prison or in exile knew something of despair, but he knew something too of resistance, of that rebellious spirit which must define us in times of oppression if we are to remain fully human. Any act of resistance, large or small, he wrote from inside his prison cell, is its own eternal triumph. Any act of resistance lights up the night sky to remind us why we were created. Hikmet captured this in his poem on living. Living is no laughing matter. You must live with great seriousness, like a squirrel, for example. I mean, without looking for something beyond and above living. I mean, living must be your whole occupation. Living is no laughing matter. You must take it seriously, so much so, and to such a degree that, for example, your hands tied behind your back, 
your back to the wall, or else in a laboratory in your white coat and safety glasses, you can die for people, even for people whose faces you've never seen, even though you know living is the most real, the most beautiful thing. I mean, you must take living so seriously that even at 70, for example, you'll plant olive trees, and not for your children either, but because although you fear death, you don't believe it, because living, I mean, weighs heavier. Let's say we're seriously ill, need surgery, which is to say we might not get up from the white table, even though it's impossible not to feel sad about going a little too soon. We'll still laugh at the jokes being told. We'll look out the window to see if it's raining or still wait anxiously for the latest newscast. Let's say we're at the front for something worth fighting for, say. There in the first offensive on that very day, we might fall on our face, dead. We'll know this with a curious anger, but we'll still worry ourselves to death about the outcome of the war, which could last years. Let's say we're in prison and close to 50, and we have 18 more years, say, before the iron doors will open. We'll still live with the outside, with its people and animals, struggle and wind. I mean with the outside beyond the walls. I mean however and wherever we are, we must live as if we will never die. This earth will grow cold, a star among stars, and one of the smallest, a gilded moat on blue velvet. I mean this, our great earth. This earth will grow cold one day, not like a block of ice or a dead cloud even, but like an empty walnut, it will roll along in pitch black space. You must grieve for this right now. You have to feel this sorrow now, for the world must be loved this much if you're going to say, I lived. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Phil Reese. I'm a member of our local Veterans for Peace chapter. And in your talk, you pointed out, you, you, you mentioned corporate and you mentioned fascism. And I would just like you to elaborate on the link between the two. Oh, the, the better term is probably inverted totalitarianism, which is taken from Sheldon Wolin's book, Democracy Incorporated, Sheldon Wolin being probably our greatest living political philosopher, taught many years at Berkeley and later at Princeton. And by that he means that it's not classical totalitarianism. It's not embodied in a demagogue or a charismatic leader. You don't have a reactionary or revolutionary party overthrowing a system, but you have corporate forces, uh, largely anonymous, that purport to pay fealty to electoral politics the constitution, the iconography and language of American patriotism, and yet internally have seized all of the levers of power. Um, so uh, I think that that is probably the best description uh, of the system that we live under, where uh, the kind of uh, the facade of democracy and the political theater of electoral politics uh, uh, keep us sort of in, entranced in a system where, you know, to, to sort of reduce it to its lowest level, it, it's impossible for any of us to vote against the interests of Goldman Sachs or ExxonMobil or Raytheon or anyone else. So, um, uh, as John Ralston Saul says, what we've undergone is a kind of coup d'etat in slow motion. Uh, and that's why we have a kind of seamless continuity 
between Bush and Obama. In fact, Obama's assault on civil liberties is worse than Bush's. Um, and, uh, you know, he's drilling the way Sarah Palin wanted to drill. Our imperial wars continue. Uh, there's no control of Wall Street, which is looting the Treasury uh, and creating another disastrous bubble. I mean, even very sober business reporters like Gretchen Morganson at the New York Times are talking now about another collapse as inevitable. So, but I think inverted totalitarianism, I did use, I was being cute using the word fascism, but I think that inverted totalitarianism is a better description of how the system works, and I highly recommend that book, Democracy Incorporated. It was a very important book for me. Wolin, if you know him, his book on de Tocqueville is amazing. Uh, Politics and Vision, his 1960 work, is one of the seminal works of political philosophy. Hi, my name is Aaron Harris, and I just wanted to ask you about your fight against the um, uh, Patriot Act and um, the other civil liberties infringements, mm -hmm. and um, how far you think our country has shifted towards like a fascist state. Because even yeah. though it's not a single leader, it still kind of follows the model. Yeah, it's a totalitarian system. It's a corporate totalitarianism in that you know, they, they write the regulations. I mean, this whole debate over the health care bill was absurd because uh, the, the health care bill was hatched in the Heritage Foundation. It was first put into practice by Romney in 2006 in Massachusetts and then adopted by Obama. Um, uh, well, I mean, the assault on civil liberties under uh, Obama has been uh, egregious. Uh, the radical reinterpretation of the 2001 Authorization to Use Military Force Act as giving the executive branch the right to assassinate American citizens, the FISA Amendment Act, which Obama as a candidate said he would filibuster and oppose, he ends up voting for it. The FISA Amendment Act is cemented into place uh, in 2008 uh, because uh, when the telecommunications companies, Verizon, Sprint, AT&T, handed over all of our personal uh, electronic uh, records of our electronic communications to the government, it was in clear violation of our right to privacy. So there were several cases in the lower court uh, against the telecommunications because they knew they'd lose. So their lobbyists wrote in retroactive immunity so they couldn't be sued. Um, and we now know from Snowden that uh, it's just wholesale storage of everyone's electronic communications which is stored in perpetuity in supercomputers in Utah. As a journalist, the use of the Espionage Act seven times by the Obama administration, including against Snowden, has shut down any, anybody within government who has a conscience who will expose the malfeasance of the inner workings of power. Um, now, the Espionage Act was not designed to silence whistleblowers. It's the equivalent of our Foreign Secrets Act. It was designed, passed in 1917 by Wilson, to prosecute people who gave state secrets or information to those defined as the enemy. And between 1917 and 2009, when Obama took office, it was used three times against whistleblowers, the first time being against Daniel Ellsberg by Nixon. Obama's used it seven times. Uh, the NDAA, Section 1021, now I sued Obama uh, and Panetta in the Southern District Court of New York over Section 1021, which says that... Uh, People who substantially support, that's not a legal term, that's not material support. Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or something called associated forces can be seized by the military, stripped of due process, and held in military facilities indefinitely, um, including our offshore penal colonies. Uh, we won that case, uh, and the reaction of the Obama administration was quite telling. Now, this is from a, a guy who was a constitutional lawyer. Uh, they sent not just the government attorneys, but they added the t attorneys from the Pentagon who showed up in Judge Forrest's chamber, she issued the ruling on a Friday, and said, you have to put the law back into effect uh, until the appellate court hears our appeal. And to her credit, Judge Forrest refused. And so they went to the Second Circuit, the appellate court, on nine o'clock on Monday morning and made the same request. And unfortunately, in the name of national security, the, the appellate court put it back into effect. Why? Now, it's one thing to appeal, but why do they aggressively have to keep the law in place? And the only thing that I and the lawyers can assume is that they're already using it, probably against Pakistani U.S. dual nationals in places like Bagram, because if they were holding people with U.S. passports, U.S. citizens in military facilities, and the law was allowed to stand, and it was ever uncovered that they were being held, the government would be in contempt of court. 
Um, we're now attempting to um, uh, get the Supreme Court to hear the case. Uh, I don't know if you followed uh, Amnesty International versus Clapper. I was also a plaintiff in that. That was on domestic spying. And the New York Times ran an article a few days ago. But when we had that case before the Supreme Court, the government argued that we as plaintiffs had no standing, had no credibility, because under the law, if we were being monitored by the government, um, we would be informed. And as the Times pointed out, we now know from Snowden the government lied. Um, so we are attempting to reopen that. But all, all of these things are mechanisms which are not done by chance. Um, they know very well what's coming, and they are creating the legal foundation by which all dissent can be criminalized. And what's interesting is that um, this crosses political lines. Every time I write about the NDAA, um, Ron Paul puts it on the top of his website. Um, uh, and it, it's, you know, you hear like on Fox News all these strict constitutionalists. I mean, this is such an egregious violation of the Constitution. And this, is not, that, this has nothing to do with left, right. Obviously, I come out of the left, but it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with basic rights. And, the, and, the, and the, you know, I, I covered the collapse of East Germany. I lived in the Stasi state. I mean, this, we are now the most photographed, monitored, controlled, spied on population in human history. This is, we have, this is nothing compared to East Germany. And, and what happens with these bureaucratic internal security machines to justify themselves is they, they end up, you know, to, to perpetuate their existence, it reaches, you know, out of like a Alfred Jari play or something. They, you know, when I was in East Germany, they were infiltrating, I'm not making this up, they were infiltrating stamp clubs of retirees. I mean, th no, that's how it, what happens. So, yeah. Um, why do you think it's so hard for like the general populace to accept that not everything's all right or that we're not going in a good direction? Or I guess the better way to ask that question is, why is it so easy to accept that everything is all right when there's a lot of evidence maybe suggesting otherwise? Well, I, I actually don't blame the public. I blame the media, which is totally corporatized. Um, the reason you have public media, public television, NPR, is so that you get a message that isn't brought to you by general dynamics. That's why, you should, that's why the BBC is still great. And we've eviscerated all forms of public information. We, you know, courtesy of Bill Clinton, when he uh, deregulated the FCC, he essentially turned most of all electronic communications over to six corporations, Viacom, General Electric, Rupert Murdoch's News Corp, Disney, Clear Channel, that's it. And they impose this, you know, we can't have a rational health care debate. We have the most expensive, least efficient health care system in the industrialized world. And what would be rational is universal health care. I've lived in France. I lived in Switzerland. It's actually a private system, but it's very heavily regulated. So in Switzerland, we would pay, I think it was about 350 francs a month, but it was controlled. And we had the best, I would argue that the Swiss healthcare system is probably the best in the world. And everyone had health care. Um, uh, so, you know, this insanity of spending 40 cents on every dollar going to corporate profits, of the fact that these corporations basically don't want to insure sick people. I mean, Obama has given them exemptions so they don't have to insure chronically ill children. I mean, look, I come out of seminary. I mean, what that, in, in the language of you know, moral theology, what it says is that we live in a country where it's legally permissible for corporations to hold sick children hostage while their parents bankrupt themselves trying to save their sons or daughters. And, and of the one million people a year who go bankrupt on medical bills, 80% of them had insurance. But the problem is that when you become incapacitated, you can't pay your premiums and you lose your insurance. I mean, it's just an utterly insidious, insidious system. Thank you very much. Thank you for speaking, first of all. I have a ton of questions, but I'll only ask one. <laughs> Your talk seems to highlight fear and the role of fear. And as a young person who is in a room full of other young people who I'm sure have the same aspirations for a good future, what would you suggest we do as people who want to see this become a just and democratic nation from what it is now? 
What do we do in your vision to fight that fear? Well, I mean, you're right. It is a completely fear-driven society. Um, I mean, what I worry about is that, you, I don't know, if I ask the students in this room who has debt, probably almost everybody in here would raise their hand. And it's not small debt. I mean, people are graduating from these schools with sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 worth of debt. And they're being thrown into a job market, we know from the demographics, where at best, you know, in most cases, they're going to be lucky to get minimum wage. Now, that's just kind of a debt peonage. And African Americans can tell you how debt peonage has long been a form of social control. Uh, and uh, so, you know, one of my great concerns is that the student body has not mobilized. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if you followed the whole reconfiguration of the student loan bill. In the short term, they're going to keep the interest rates, but in the long term, they're going to jack them up, higher than if you went to a bank to borrow it. And it's the, the cruelty of it, the fact that, you know, you can declare bankruptcy, but it doesn't erase student debt. It just keeps accruing. I mean, this is just insane. And, and so you walk out of college having invested in your own education, and you're just crippled. Um, and they want it that way. Uh, so, you know, I lived in France. My son is now uh, doing graduate work in Paris. And I said to him, you know, if you told French university students that they had to pay forty dollars or $50,000 a year to go to university, they'd shut the damn country down. And you should shut the damn country down because you have a right to your education without walking out. The fact that you came to college, you worked hard, you don't, it, it's so wrong. Um, when I went to college, I had no money, but I, I, got, I, I got money, if you can believe it, from the state. We had a program called TAP, we had Regents, I got lots of money. And they, all of those prob programs have been eviscerated. So you go to, I've taught at Princeton, I mean, you know, you get a certain segment of the population. The rest are just the ultra-rich. So, uh, and, you know, I worry about, as a father, environmentally. And we have totally betrayed you. And I think that as things unravel, you're going to look back at us, with, and you should, with a great deal of hatred and say, what did you do? Not only you didn't do anything, you lied to us. I guess you made us feel good for the moment. Um, and much of my own activism, and I've been arrested in the Occupy movement in front of Goldman Sachs and other places, is because I have kids. And so I fail. At least my kids will know I tried. And, and, and I worry about your generation. I have my oldest son is 23. I mean, I have kids your age. My daughter is a sophomore in college. I'm terrified. And, I'm ter and I just am so angry at my generation for doing this to you and for not being honest with you. I mean, it's bleak. I mean, read climate change reports. I don't make them up. And, it's, and, and it scares me. I mean, my littlest kid, my littlest son, his favorite book is Out of the Blue. These are like pictures of narwhals. And, and every time I see it, it rips my heart out because I know that if there is not a radical change, every single one of those sea creatures will be dead in his lifetime. And, you know, if we were a sane culture, we would declare a national emergency over climate change instead of spending half of our uh, defense budget building tomahawk missiles to drop on Syria. It's insane. It's utter, but that's how empires die. They go insane. So um, I really actually think all of this transcends politics. Um, and it's interesting that um, I'm not a libertarian. I have problems with libertarianism. But it's interesting that, um, that the libertarians on so many issues, uh, uh, and, and, you know, you can look even at, at the right-wing critique of corporate capitalism, you know, we converge on that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think you need to begin to stand up now and fight for your future. And that means civil disobedience. And, I mean, going to jail is more time than I care to donate to the U.S. government. Um, and I don't like it in there, but I do it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, Chris. My name is Julie Edgar. Thanks um, for everything you said. Um, I think my...
I think my question kind of got eaten in that answer. I was going to say, uh, standing here within the context of a wonderful peace and justice, uh, you know, program that brings, uh, and, and, you know, a credentialed, amazing person like you here to share with us what are the values of a college education these days, because as an activist mom, I have a junior and a senior in high school, and that, you know they want a liberal education, they're looking forward to a life, and I'm aware of the climate crisis and feeling all of the very same things, and yet this incredible love for life, and uh, so, um, you know, what, 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 what do you think are the values of uh, uh, going through the system and getting a liberal education? Well, I'm a product the of the system. I, I spent eight years in a university without getting a doctorate, which took some effort. Um, <laughs> I'm a product of, the, of a liberal arts education, um, uh, and that's all I did was read literature and classics and theology and philosophy and history. And, um, and I think that, for me, the assault on the humanities is quite frightening because the humanities, the, the nature of a humanities education is to teach you how to think, not what to think. And teaching somebody how to think is not that easy. Um, you know, I would probably say I could really begin to critically dissect a text maybe my second year of graduate school at Harvard. That it, it, you know, I just, you know, you have to be taught. You have to have a wealth of ideas. Um, and I worry that there's just too much distraction for this generation through electronic hallucinations that they're not reading. Um, and, you, and even if they do read, they have something stuck in their ears or like they're on their Facebook page. That's a really bad idea. It is, because you can't concentrate. You can't ingest complex ideas. You can't read the origins of totalitarianism. I'm not even going to pretend like I know what kind of music you're listening to, but if you're... You can't. And, and you Chris, need I to. I found you on Facebook. I don't have a Facebook page. It's a, somebody no, put it up. Okay, I, but I'm not on Facebook. Um, my younger son, when he was 12, I think you'll like this, he almost got sent to the principal's office because in his social studies class, he quoted one of your book titles. They, they were talking about war, and one of the girls said, Mr. So-and-so, why do we always talk about war? And the teacher said, well, it's more dramatic. And Jack said, do you mean war is a force that gives us meaning? There you go. And the, and the teacher was speechless. He's like, uh, question, really just, I'm pissed. And a lot of people are pissed. There's a lot of anger. What the hell do we do? I don't want to be violent, but my older son is influenced a lot by Derek Jensen. I just talked to Derek yesterday. And what the fuck, excuse my language, do we do? I'm sick of it. I'm right. sick well, of this shit. You know, I actually debate, I debate Derek. I, I like Derek, we're, we're friends, but we've had many debates over the issue of violence, and my argument with Derek is that he doesn't actually, violence for him is theoretical, it's not for me. As a war correspondent, I know very well what violence does and how it works. And um, I have, within the Occupy movement battle, the black bloc, uh, because uh, we're, that's not the way we're going to win. Um, the fact is, the state has guaranteed that there will be further uprisings and unrest. That if the state had responded rationally to the Occupy movements, and remember the Occupy movements, which had all sorts of internal problems, which I'm well aware of, but the Occupy movements were forcibly eradicated by the state, by Barack Obama. And the, um, if the state had responded rationally to dissipate the suffering, the misery, the anger that pushed people into those encampments, they would have declared a moratorium on bank foreclosures and repossessions. They would have uh, forgiven all student debt. They would have created a rational health care program. Capitalists have no business being anywhere near a health care program. Uh, and they would have created a massive jobs program targeted at people under the age of 25. That would have been rational, but they didn't. They responded solely with the language of force and Things are worse. Unemployment benefits are being cut back. Head Start programs are being shut down. 
you know, unfettered, unregulated capitalism, as Karl Marx understood, is a revolutionary force. It has no self-imposed limits. And um, it will exploit and consume and exhaust everything until it kills itself. That's really where we are. So 40% of the summer Arctic sea ice melts, and for shell oil, the death throes of our planet is a business opportunity. They are nothing is going to stop them now unless we stop them. And, um, and so because they have no self-imposed limits, because there's no internal restraint through government regulation or anything else, something's coming. I've covered movements all over the world. I covered the two Palestinian uprisings or intifadas. I covered the revolutions in East Euro Eastern Europe, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Romania. I covered the street demonstrations that brought down Milosevic. And one knows as a reporter that the tinder is there, but one never knows what ignites it. It's kind of mysterious. I mean, my great sort of window into that moment or that inability to control popular movements. I w on uh, November 9th, 1989, I was in Leipzig with the leaders of the East German opposition. And they said, this was in the afternoon, they said, maybe within a year we'll have free passage back and forth across the Berlin Wall. Within hours, the Berlin Wall, at least as an impediment to human traffic, did not exist. Even they didn't know. And so something will happen. It's usually triggered by something very, you know, seemingly benign. You know, an elderly woman is about to be evicted from her home because she can't pay her mortgage or the bank has taken her house and she commits suicide. And then people say, enough. Something is coming. What worries me is that we have very powerful proto-fascist movements embodied in groups like the Tea Party, the militias, the lunatic fringe of the Republican right that speak in the language of violence, celebrate the gun culture, and do what fascist movements do, which is one, uh, sacralize or fuse religious symbols, Christian symbols with the state. Um, but they also deflect anger away, I, and I covered the fall of Yugoslavia, it was the same kind of thing, they deflect anger away from, uh, from central forms of power that have created the crisis towards the vulnerable. So you already see it in the language. Um, you know, Muslims, undocumented workers, homosexuals, liberals, feminists, you know, they have a long, African Americans, they have a long list of people they hate. And um, they have the most retrograde elements of American capitalism, the Koch brothers, and others, Sheldon, Adelson, who put money behind them. And in that sense, it becomes like the Nazi party. I mean, the relationship between the Nazi party and the business class in Germany was very shaky. Uh, and you saw it with Cruz. Cruz comes out of the Christian right. Most of the lunatics in the house who shut down the government come out of the Christian right. Um, and, you know, I wrote a book on them. It's called American Fascists, the Christian Right, and the War on America. I was trying to reach out to them. And, uh, but I think that they, are, they, are, they represent an authentically fascist movement. Yeah. Um, Mr. Hedges, first off, I want to say thank you. Your words shall resound with me for the rest many years to come. Um, you must also be a psychic because not only had you pre-answered her question, but you also kind of covered some basis of, uh, of what I was looking to hear. Um, my question to you is how much more... Um, how much farther down the rabbit hole do we have to fall? And what is the greatest precipice that can cause the change that we need, the biggest threat to our own individualism and freedoms currently? And just one issue, if you could put your finger on it, that you see as forthcoming and the most important that we should be wary of. Yeah, I mean, the the... the as Saul says, I mean, what we've undergone is what he calls this coup de, corporate coup d'etat in slow motion. But they, you know, these forces need a crisis in order to sort of put us all in shackles. That's what brings radical movements to the fore. So, in the case of Yugoslavia, and in the case of Weimar, it was hyperinflation. It was the collapse of the economic system, which vomited up these figures like Radovan Karadzic, Slobodan Milosevic, Franjo Tuzman, and others in the same way you vomited up Hitler and the Nazi party. Um, uh, and, and what happens, and one of the reasons why 
uh, I have been so fierce in my critique of Obama and Clinton and have been a stalwart supporter of Nader. I wrote, was Nader's speechwriter in 2008. I gave a talk at the University of Wisconsin and some students said, yeah, we like Nader, but his speeches are so boring. <laughs> it's because I come out of Yugoslavia where I watched a weak, ineffectual, self-identified liberal center, and this would be Weimar, that uh, was, and you know, Dostoevsky writes about this in Demons, Notes from Underground, uh, is that when that center is unable to respond to the concerns of the citizenry and you fall into a crisis, the tendency, because the liberal uh, center has been ineffectual in a way, I'm talking about like our concerns, Clinton and Obama have been ineffectual. What happens is that they turn on the, not just the liberals, but they turn on traditional liberal values, which I actually care quite a bit about. And uh, Sebastian Hofner in his book, uh, Define Hitler, which is a really fascinating book. I, I live on in Princeton, and down my street is this amazing retired Princeton professor who was a Marine Corps pilot in World War II. Um, anyway, Sam Hines, and he gave me the book. He said, you wanna know what's happening in America? Read this book. And Hofner writes about that weak liberal center. Uh, they have the Reichstag fire, and uh, the, uh, the Christian Democrats flee to Lugano, to Switzerland. And uh, I didn't even know this, but it, where uh, Hofner was, 100,000 people go out in the streets of Leipzig to protest, but there's no leadership. The, the opposition political parties have fled. And, uh, and, and so the danger is that, um, and I think as Niebuhr's quote in my talk was clear, that liberalism becomes a very ineffectual force uh, against these totalitarian movements. And... Um, and the anger sees a kind of revulsion at the values that people like Obama claim they support, when in fact, of course, they work on behalf of Wall Street. Um, it's all rhetorical. And so that's why you know, I voted for Jean Stein, Jill Stein in the last election, um, just as a kind of protest vote. Um, and I worry that we're not immune to that. But it will take a crisis, and it will either be economic, or it will be environmental, or it'll be both. And then we're in really serious trouble. Thank you very much for your lecture. I believe great numbers of our citizens identify themselves as church-going Christians. At the same time, the picture, I believe an accurate one, uh, of the very desperate dehumanizing forces in our society uh, the way our society is now going seems to be at loggerheads with, um, with what I would describe as the basic teachings of the Christian faith. Or at least at loggerheads, I guess the distinction is necessary, with the teachings of Jesus. Um, I'm wondering if you see any possibility whatever for some kind of countering force developing from Christian churches in the United States to somehow mitigate uh, the grossly dehumanizing and uh, normalized official dehumanizing that is going on. Um, whether you see any, any kind of counterforce coming from that quarter, uh, if not, uh, why not? Uh, if not, then what might happen in that quarter to produce some kind of counterforce? Well, I, I wish we could because I come out of that tradition. My father was a minister. I grew up in the church. My mother was a seminary graduate professor. I went, obviously graduated from seminary. But the church um, has refused to face the most crucial issues of our time. Um, I come out of the Presbyterian Church. It, like most mainstream denominations, is dying, uh, split between an aging, traditionally liberal constituency and an evangelical wing, and uh, although a lot of the evangelicals just left over, um, over uh, the ordination of gays. Um, uh, so 
for me, there's a couple failures. One, the church didn't confront the Christian right. I mean, uh, you know, you don't have to get a degree, as I did from Harvard Divinity School, to realize that Jesus didn't come to make us rich. Um, and, and he certainly didn't come to bless the dropping of iron fragmentation bombs by the American Air Force all over the Middle East. And, and so what you had was this species of Christian heretics, Pat Robertson, Joel Olstein, all these people who acculturated the Christian religion with the worst aspects of American capitalism and greed and American imperialism. And the mainstream church, which should have known better, didn't denounce them. That was a terrible failing. And it was left up to the so-called new atheists, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, Dawkins. I debated uh, Harris at UCLA, and I debated Hitchens at Berkeley, not an experience I'd wish on anyone in this room. <laughs> and these people were just as chauvinistic as the Christian right in the name of Western civilization. They all wanted to bomb Muslims, but just because they were barbaric, the Christian right wants to bomb them because they're satanic. But the politically, they converge because they were just secular fundamentalists. And I kept, I debated them late. I'd not read their works. Um, and I was a little appalled that the church hadn't re reacted to, you know, that had left it to these people to react. Um, the church has retreated largely into a kind of how is it with me spirituality, which is just narcissism. And uh, I mean, we have now, uh, and it's part of the reason I teach in a prison, and I all recommend to you Michelle Alexander's great book, The New Jim Crow, we have created through drug laws essentially a new Jim Crow for people of color. Where's the church? Uh, where's the church on corporate capitalism? And, um, you know, I think the problem is that, um, you know, as, and I come from the New York Times, uh, the traditional journalism is suffering much the same, that as these institutions become weaker, they become more timid, which is exactly, of course, produces the fact that they become weaker. And I think that's the problem with the church. Um, you, you know, I have, you know, you as a minister, you end up in some congregation, and you don't want to offend anybody there because they're barely putting enough money in the plate to pay you as it is, uh, and so you end up uh, not saying anything. I, I mean, I, you know, I still look for those figures, those William Sloan Coffins, those Will Campbells, those uh, Father Daniel Berrigan who baptized my daughter. Um, you know, where are they? And um, we need them. We really need them. I'm with you on that. Um, because I think this is a moral crisis. And I think the corporate forces arrayed against us in theological terms are forces of death, literally. Um, and I think the language of traditional religiosity is, is imperative. I mean, that's one of the reasons why, if you go look on YouTube, every time I go to, uh, I'm given a talk at uh, Occupy Wall Street, it's just a sermon. Basically, it's a sermon. Um, and, uh, and I think there is a need for it, uh, but I don't know that the institutional church is going to give it to us. I think we have time maybe for one more question. Well, let's do two more. We'll okay. do that. Go ahead. I'm not going anywhere. Mr. Hedges, thank you very much for coming to the Lehigh Valley. I think this is about it as uh, post-industrial America as you're going to find. <laughs> um, yeah, you should get it here. My, my, I look around the room, and the, the folks here that are 60s generation, really take a moment and thank and shake the hand of the 20-year-olds that showed up tonight. Because you know what? My, and this, is, this leads to my question. I was at Occupy from day one. Actually, In Zuccotti? I, actually, I'll tell you where, Saz Faye with Michael White before it even, before it even started. Right. I, I got tuned in, I, I spent the whole year with Occupy documenting. Um, what I want to ask is, uh, how do we get more 20 year olds in this room? What do we need to do? Because somehow well, we're not Well, but look at affected. Occupy had plenty of 20 year olds. Uh, what happens is they graduate from college uh, and they owe $75,000 a year and it's two years later and they're living at home working in a deli that's the best recruiting weapon Occupy has. Uh, and um, I don't take that away from them. I think, you know, uh, people are, I mean, was, you were involved in Occupy. What's really interesting is we could never mobilize anyone at NYU because they said, hey, man, we're going to the 1%. Um, you, you could get students from Brooklyn Community College or, you know, they'd come, they get it. 
Um, and oh my, you don't even want to go near Princeton. I mean, you know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of them will be the one percent. Uh, so I think that you know, as students get out and run into that wall, um, then it will force them to ask questions. I mean, I feel terrible. I mean, I don't want to get up and say this. I'd love to give you a wonderful, but I'm just not going to lie to you. You know, there are enough people lying to you, and um, I. I'm, I'm terrified for my own kids. I'm terrified for this generation, which um, uh, is going to face some really rough times. And uh, it will naturally be politicized through fate and circumstance. Um, so there's a kind of quiescence on campuses, largely, because I think people are fooled. I, mean, I think that they live in that cocoon sustained by loans, and they haven't been hit yet. But they'll come. They'll come. I mean, all great resistance movements are not built like pe people like me. I mean, I don't really like sleeping on concrete too much. Um, I'm not good at it. And uh, like four days of bagels, that's enough. Uh, but when you're young, you know, and you got that kind of energy and spirit, and you know, not just that, I learned so much from Occupy. I learned so much in terms of, you know, how self-governance and the way, I mean, it was really a creative, amazing, I mean, it broke down when it got large, but consensus went at the beginning, I don't know if you were there at the beginning, yeah. it worked, you know, those first few weeks. It didn't work when you got 4,000 people and the one guy making a block work for the NYPD. I mean, they found the weaknesses of the system, but. You know, I, I would just, like, I spent a lot of time there. I would go sit in the People's Library. And you had all these retired New York City librarians fussing over their 5,000 books. And I'm sure your experience was like mine, that afterwards, and it was quite moving for me, one of the things people in the Occupy movement mourned the most was the destruction of the library. And we were going down and doing, like, you can watch them on YouTube, these, like, teach-ins, you know? And it's, like, 60 people out on the concrete... You know, I did a People's Hearing of Goldman Sachs with Cornell West, who I love. I admire Cornell so much. And Cornell, uh, we went in the day before and met with the Direct Action Committee, and then we, WBAI broadcast it live, and we had, um, uh, uh, you know, pe women, single mothers who'd been evicted from their homes and New York City school teachers who'd lost their jobs. But then after we met with the... Well, we were met till late at night, and then Cornell and I stayed in New York. We went to dinner, and Cornell said, where are, where are all these so-called intellectuals? Where are they? They're too busy. They're, I mean, all these great social... Where are they? Nowhere. And, you know, Cornell was... We went to the Manning trial uh, together, and Cornell, because he's so recognizable, it's very humbling to go into a room with Cornell. I, I'm nothing. I might as well just be carrying his bags behind him, you know. <laughs> I had to introduce myself once. I just said, I'm Cornell's driver. I just drive, I drive. But, so Cornell won't go public transport because he's, everybody comes up and it's exhausting. So, so he, he, we, he lives in Princeton. So we have to get up at three in the morning to drive. I pick Cornell up at three. I mean, luckily, like, it's just a graduate seminar all the way down to Fort Meade. The guy's so smart. So um, the last time we, he called me the night before the sentencing, and he said, you know, we got to go. And I was like, oh, God, I got to get up at 3. And he said, no, we have to go because we will be the only public intellectuals there. And he was right. And, you know, two days ago, I got a letter from Fort Leavenworth from Chelsea Manning. And Chelsea Manning said, I wasn't allowed to turn around, but I surreptitiously glanced, and I saw you in Cornell, and I want to thank you for being there. I had to call Cornell, you know, and, and he's right. Um, I mean, that is part of the bankruptcy of the intellectual class, especially within the humanities, who have retreated into this jargon-filled, you know, uh, and, and, you know, the, it's so hard to find, I mean, Cornell comes out of an institution, he's at Union now, but he's a real rarity. I mean, I don't have any institutional affiliation, so, you know, I don't, I don't have those kind of constraints. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think that, that, um, you know, my concern is that that people your age and people, you know, that they not be left alone and that 
those of us who have an understanding and have, um, you know, a, a more experience and everything, you know, that we, that we stand with you. And I felt that from my generation, there were, weren't very many. Um, and I think, again, that was a terrible, terrible failing. Again, another failing on the part of my generation towards all of you. So it's a kind, I mean, I'm, in the end, I'm just here as a form of repentance. <laughs> <laughs> so one last question, go ahead. I don't get any right-wingers taking me on. I'm going to just say it's mine only because I was online first, because I, I just really okay. want to say something. Okay. Um, I understand everything you've been saying, and I agree with most of it, but I've come to the point, given my gray hair and my age, and starting out in 1964, understanding that I had to demonstrate against the um, Vietnam War, coming from a very conservative religious background. Um, but at this point in my life, I've looked at history and I don't see anything new. I see these cycles and I see people like you saying things that other people have said, encouraging people to stand up, to disagree. Some people will fight, people will get killed. Things will change for a while and they go back to the same, the same controllers. And so right now I have no clue why we're here, why I believe in reincarnation, why we reincarnate, um, but that's, just me. That's where I, how I can deal with everyday life. I don't believe in suicide. But I understand it now if you choose it. Because I, I really feel there's no reason to be alive on this planet anymore. The planet's beautiful. But history has proven that, um, well, for me, that life is meaningless. Um, but on the other hand, as far as ways of showing the controllers that you don't want them to control you. People have to look at the whole food system and understand that when they don't buy the food that the manufacturers put out there as food, that that's revolutionary. And when they don't accept the medicine that they say is the best way to deal with your health or to keep you healthy, that's revolutionary. Because they have used their mind control to convince you that at least in those two areas, they are really looking out for your good, and they're not. Again, they're only looking out for right. profit. All right, let me, let me just deal with rebellion, which I think was something I tried to touch on in my talk. Rebellion is a moral imperative. It is not relevant. It is not for the practical. It's not relevant whether it succeeds. I'll give you an example. And it's a kind of pyrrhic victory, but it's still a victory. So after Bloomberg made his first attempt to shut down the park, and failed, largely because Teamsters Union members showed up at 6 o'clock and held off the NYPD. We knew Bloomberg was coming. And we knew that everything was infiltrated. We knew that all of our electronics were being captured and analyzed. So I guess I'm not giving away. I guess I don't know if I should. Well, so the direct act, members of the Direct Action Committee came down to my house in Princeton, camped out all over the floor. We decided, what are we going to do? Because we're not going to take it lying down. We, we know he has the capacity to clear the park, but we must resist. And so everybody put their cell phones in the car, and we only wrote messages back and forth. And then we burned the paper in the fireplace. And through the messages, it was decided that 20 activists, when the police came in, would be within their backpacks, have bike locks and chains. And when the police started coming in, they would chain themselves to the kitchen. And they did. And when the police got to the kitchen, they did not have chain cutters. And they had to wait four hours to go back and get it. Now, did that stop the clearing of the park? No. But it's in those tiny moments of defiance that, for those of us who are involved, it's deeply empowering. Because we didn't take it lying down. We fought back. And not only that, we fought back in a way that they didn't understand what was, they were going to face when they got in the park. I covered uh, the Velvet Revolution. I was in the Magic Lantern Theater every night with Václav Havel and Klaus and everybody who inherited the Czech government. They'd been fighting since Charter 77, 1977. His, Havel's 1978 essay, The Power of the Powerless, is brilliant about living in truth. That winter, in the streets of Prague, 
on every street, there were posters of a young Charles University student named Jan Pollock, who when the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia and overthrew Dubček, went to Venceslaus Square, lit himself on fire, and died of his burns. His fellow students, thousands of them, marched with his body from the university to the cemetery. They were broken up by the police. None of it was ever reported. It was because it was state-controlled media. It was a non-event. When his grave became a shrine, the communist government dug up his remains, cremated them, gave the ashes to his mother, and said she couldn't rebury them. Two weeks after the communist government fell, 10,000 people went to Red Army Square, and they renamed it Jan Pollock Square. I was in Vensela Square the night that Marta Kubasheva, who before 1968 was the most popular singer in Czechoslovakia, walked out on a balcony. She had sung the anthem of defiance that was broadcast on the airwaves as the Soviet tanks were rolling in. And when the pro-Soviet regime was put back in place, she also became a non-person to the extent that where they destroyed her entire recording stock and her voice was never heard over the airwaves. She had spent the intervening years working at an assembly line in a toy factory. I was there, there were 500,000 people in that crowd. She walked out on that balcony, she started singing that anthem, and every Czech in that crowd knew every word. You never know where the good goes. If you stand up to do what's right and to speak truth to power, there are many people who you think are asleep who hear it. And that's why we have to do what we have to do. And that, for me, is hope. It's not the pie in the sky hope of a utopian tomorrow. It's the hope of the power of resistance and that when we do the good, it draws the good to us. Thank you. <laughs>